So let's look at the knapsack problem. So the knapsack problem has like a pretty simple formulation. So kind of general motivation is, you know, this is another one of those like thief hypotheticals. We saw one in the in the one of the previous sessions where you know there's a line of houses and the thief has to figure out which houses to rob. Well, this one's a little different. So this one is like what the thief does like after he breaks into the house. So the thief breaks into a house, um, and there's a number of items there in the house, uh, and each item has like a certain value. And you know, for sake of argument, like let's say the thief can actually accurately determine the value of every item that he could potentially take. Uh, and every item also has a weight. So for example, you might think like, okay, like if a thief breaks into a house, like what is the best things for them to take? Like on one hand, you know, you could take somebody's television, right? And like that's like pretty valuable maybe if they have like a really like nice like flat screen TV. Uh, but it's like also like a very heavy object. Like you're not gonna steal like five televisions and just like walk out of the house, right? You gotta like park the van outside if you wanna do that. Uh, <coughs> But, but let's say the thief has like a certain like carrying capacity. Like th they can carry like so many pounds with them. Like for now we'll ignore like volume and things like that. Uh, whether or not they can actually like, you know, squeeze your couch out of the front door. Uh, but uh, let's say like there's a certain uh, capacity, right? Uh, so, so like the thief has a certain weight limit, call it like W. Uh, let's call it W. So there's like some limit, W. And, you know, the thief is limited to, like, carrying this amount. And then inside the house, there's basically a bunch of items. Like, you can think of them represented as a list. There's, like, some list L of items. And, and the list can be seen as basically a bunch of pairs. Like, uh, each one having, like, a weight and a value. Weight 1, value 1. Weight 2, value 2. Weight three, value three, etc. So on one hand, the thief can take some really valuable things like a television, but then they probably can't carry much more. On the other hand, the thief could take some like really like, you know, they could take like your cheese or something, which you know it doesn't really like fill up their capacity much, but also just doesn't have much value. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, you know, just kind of intuitively thinking about the situation, what does the thief normally take? Right? They take like the va the items that are like really light but also like really valuable, right? So, uh, you know, you might think the thief, okay, wants to take like really high value items like jewelry, money, you know, that are like really light, but also like, uh, you know, has a lot of value. But the optimization problem just kind of asks, like given this list, like uh, for each item, you basically have to make a decision, like to take it or to not take it. Now there's a couple of variants on this problem. There's ones where like you're allowed to take multiple copies of the same item, or like there's one where there's like a quantity associated with each item and you can take any number from like zero to, to whatever the limit quantity of this item is. But like let's look at the simplest version first. So there's just a list of items, one at a time, and for each item the thief just has to decide like take or not take. And the thief does get to see the entire list before they d make their decision. Um, and there's a certain limit they have to respect. They can't go over this much total value. This is like capital W, uh, total value. And the goal is, can you maximize your total value that you will get while ensuring that the choices you make, their sum has to stay under the constraint. So for example, if, uh, let's say you have like, in one example, like let's say, you have a weight of 5 and a value of 10. Uh, you have a weight of 3 and a value of 20. And you have a weight of, uh, a weight of 9 and a value of, uh, let's say, 15. Um, and then let's say your weight limit is 10. So here the best choice would be to take like these first two items. You don't want to take this item, even though it's pretty valuable, because if you take this item, you can't take anything else. But if you take these two items, this is like pretty good. Uh, you know, you get a total value of 30, and uh, you use up eight weight, and then you waste two, because there's nothing else you can take with that. Okay. Now, the, you know, if, if you just think of, like intuitively about, about this problem, you can maybe like come up with a heuristic for solving this problem. We'll call this a heuristic. 
Like it means, like heuristic basically means like this algorithm kind of makes no guarantee that you find the optimal solution. It's just kind of like a rule of thumb kind of rule. So here's a rule of thumb idea for solving this problem. Uh, before we even like see like how dynamic programming solves this or anything like that, like just simple rule of thumb idea for solving this problem, right? Uh, so the th for each item, we're going to calculate like a value to weight ratio, like so. Like here we calculate V2 over W2, V3 over W3. Uh, why does that make sense? So this basically kind of tells us like how value rich the item is. Like per unit of weight, how much does this add to our portfolio, right? And then here's an idea, like just take the items in order of this ratio. So this is actually pretty logical. This is like probably like what a lot of pe like people would intuitively do, right? Uh, but it actually doesn't guarantee that the solution you get is optimal. And the reason why not is, well, let's look at like a very kind of like very, very extreme case where you could get like a really bad solution. So let's assume that your weight limit is, I don't know, let's say your weight limit is 10, right? And let's say you have, a, you, you have an item that has a value of, I don't know, let's say it has a value of 20, and it has a weight of just one. So this is like a very, very like value rich item. You see like, like the value to weight ratio here is 20. And let's say that now you have a bunch of other items, like let's say you have these two, and these have weight five, um, and they have like a much more modest value, like the value is like, I don't know, 15, let's say. Right? So, like, ratio-wise, value over weight here is 20. And here, it's only 3, right? So these aren't, like, intuitively equally good items. But the problem is, if you take this, uh, if you actually, well, hold on, hold on, wait, oops, I set up the example wrong. Let's say, let, let's, make, let's make it 10 here, 10. Uh, so, so still, like, this value is much better, right? Like, I mean, I mean this value to weight ratio is 10. This is, like, a really value-dense item. And these are only like three. But the problem is, like, let's say you, you actually like take uh, this item, right? So you take this item, but your capacity is 10. So after you take this item, your capacity is down to nine. And now you can only take one of these, right? So your total value will be 25 here. Like the total you will get is 25. If you take this item first, then you take this item, and then here you say, okay, I've run out. Uh, you, you see the problem. But instead, you should have just taken these two. And why is this better? It's because you better use the full capacity that you have, right? So like in the case where you take this item and then you take this item, you get a total weight of six and a value of 25. That is like really good density, but you now have four units of space that you can't use in any way. Whereas if you just took these two, you wouldn't have any wasted space. And that's why, you know, it's kind of like this bin packing, uh, aspect of this problem that makes it hard, figuring out like what items you should take so that you don't have any wasted space. Uh, well, I mean, in some cases it may be better to waste some space, just, so, you know, there may be items that are so valuable you just have to have them, even if it means you will end up kind of like with wasted space in your knapsack. Uh, but at the same time, like it's good to avoid wasting space, and if you purely prioritize just, the, you know, taking the values that are most dense, uh, you know, that is a flaw of this heuristic, that it doesn't always find the best value because you may end up in a situation where you're wasting space. Uh, you know, for like the most extreme example, if you want to make this example like really, really extreme, you can kind of see it like this. And this will also prove to you that like the heuristic, like it may not even be anywhere close to the optimal solution. Like here, okay, in this first case we set up, it wasn't too bad. In this first case that we set up with like this 10 here, uh, okay, we got a solution that was worth 25, whereas the best solution was worth 30. But like, what if like you have, I don't know, a situation like this? Like this, you have a capacity of 1,000 pounds, but and this still only weighs one, and this has a weight of 10, right? But then here, you know, you have an item that's weight 1,000 and has value 1,000, right? You see the problem here, the ratio. Here it is 10, right? Here the ratio is 10. And here the ratio is only 1. 
So like per unit of weight, this is a much better item. This is like a ring or something, and this is like a flat screen TV. But the problem is like somehow it just so happens that if you take the TV, you can't carry even that little ring uh, in this like extreme example, right? Uh, and so, you know, if you take the ring first, then you won't be able to pick up the TV, and now you've got a, kind of a problem, because you only got 10 value, whereas the optimal value was 1,000. So you can see how this heuristic can go bad in like a really like bad way. Okay, so let's think, uh, you know, how we can actually solve this problem and give like an exact solution to the problem. And then we'll discuss like what shortcomings that method has, and that will lead us to some of the other uh, discussion. You can actually prove that this strategy of taking like highest ratio first, like this is actually completely optimal if you are allowed to cut objects and get that part of their value. Like what I mean is like this strategy would have been optimal if like for example you could take this ring and then you have 999 units left. So you take 999 thousandths of this object and you get that portion of its value. You can understand that if this is a TV, then you probably can't do that, right? Like, well, you take the chainsaw to the TV, and then you, know, you sell the TV for whatever fraction of the TV you cut off. It, it doesn't really work that way, right? So yeah, but, but it, there is like a variation of this problem called the fractional knapsack. In the fractional knapsack, you're allowed to take partial copies of an object, and if you do, you actually receive you know, that fraction of the object that you took as value. And in that one, you can actually prove that the greedy algorithm, greedy on this basis, that like, you take highest ratio first, and you, you, know, you descend in like, de order of decreasing ratio, you can prove that this is completely optimal in that situation. But in this, like, this is called the zero one knapsack problem. Because for every item, you could decide whether it takes zero copies of it or one copy of it. Every item has to be either taken or not taken. Okay. So, uh, any you know, any uh, more questions about you know about that? Okay. Yeah. So let's see. You know. Okay. So you're not happy that you know you cannot. You're not relying on this heuristic, right? Now, you know, most humans, like, they would have common sense, right? If they, like, picked up that one object and then they were like, oh, wait, this other object is, like, so much bigger that it's blocking. But, like, okay, you would, like, take something out and you would put the bigger object in. Uh, but it's, it's hard to say under, like, exactly what logic you would do that, right? Like, if you try to think, like, what algorithm you would actually use, it's kind of hard to say, right? It's kind of just like if you feel like you have too much wasted space, then maybe you take out one of the small objects to give, get like a bigger object. But exactly which small object do you take out? How much empty space do you allow? It's kind of really unclear. And you know, if, if you have a kind of a human solve this problem, like they'll actually probably solve it. Like not probably not like find the exact optimum, but they'll find like a value pretty close to the optimum. But it's kind of hard to say like exactly under what logic you're doing it. Like some humans may be better than doing it at others. You know, I guess thieves are probably good at it. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we want to find like a computational solution to this problem. Uh, you know, now as you know, as we mentioned in like the other thief problem, like there's no way that like, the thief knows the computational solution because you know if they did, they would get like a job at Google. They wouldn't have to go robbing houses, right? Uh, we mentioned that in like the last problem as well. Uh, so the thief obviously doesn't know how to do this, but you know dynamic programming. Uh, so let's you know give the dynamic programming uh, solution to this. So you have some like weight limit. And you have some list of items, like weight one, value one, dot, 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 weight n, value n. So, uh, you know, it should be fairly simple to define a function here. So the way we can kind of imagine it is we just go through the items one by one, and for each item we just kind of accept or reject the item. Okay, so, so, so now you have this function. Uh, so, uh, what information do you need? 
Well, first of all, you need to capture like your current position in this sequence. Because we're imagining this as kind of a process. Like you go to the first item, you accept or reject it. You go to the second item, you decide to accept or reject it. So to capture kind of like the state of where you are in this process, you will need like an index i. This index, you know, obviously captures some kind of information. About, like, well, it captures specifically like the index of like where you are in the process. So first you start on the, you know, zeroth index or whatever, and then you, you know, go forward. And also, you need to keep in mind of how much your like, remaining capacity is. As you decide whether to accept an object or not, that may change depending on like, how much capacity you have left. So we can say that the optimal solution to the problem at any given time, uh, remember uh, like last time we talked about this, that you know, just imagine that you know, you're, you're kind of like in the middle, you're, you're, you're kind of seeing yourself as like a robot who is solving this problem. And at you know, a specific point in time as you're solving this problem, you basically have to decide, you know, how do I finish the problem optimally from where I am currently? So, so, so the, the thief will go through these items, these knapsack items, one by one, and the thief will like accept or reject each one. So at any given time, they are at a particular location, at a particular, they've reached a particular index in this list, and depending on their previous choices, they have some amount of spare capacity left. So they have this like i, and they have this parameter w, which is like the remaining capacity that you have left. So w starts at capital W, which is like this limit, but it may decrease as you go. And if it reaches zero, then you stop. You cannot take any more items. Okay, so, so, um, you know, as we said, write the general case first. We want to write the general case of the recursion first because that will kind of inform us as to whether this is even viable, whether we're even able to like construct this recursion and so on. And then we can like figure out, okay, what are the, what are the base cases and all that. Okay, uh, so if I am at index i and I have capacity w, I can either take this item, right? Uh, like, so in, the, in that case, it would be like, I'm somewhere in this list and I had some things come before here and I'm currently looking at this wi and value i. And I'm at index i. I'm looking at this i of tuple, right? So I can either accept this item or I can reject it. If, if I accept it, that means that uh, I will advance to the next index. I will get to this i plus one index and you know, I will now have W minus WI, right? Like, I, I, I lose this much capacity. Uh, like, I, I pay for the capacity of this item. I lose, so I lose this much capacity. I advance to the next index. And I also have to give myself credit for the item I just took. So that I give myself some, this value I. So this is one option. This is the option where we take the item. The other option is when we decline the item, right? If we decline the item, then, uh, you know, I'll put this value here. Uh, what do we get? We get F, we advance to the next index. Um, we do not lose anything in our capacity, right? Because we declined the item, or we skipped it. Our capacity, our remaining capacity remains the same. And we do not add its value because we didn't take it. Uh, okay, so then we have two options. We have this option, one, and we have this option, two, and we want to do the better of these two things, so we're just going to take the max of these. Okay, so if you're, like, you know, if you've been following the rest of the dynamic programming le lectures and, you know, you have uh, already familiar with dynamic programming, this shouldn't be, like, you know, very you know, like a very difficult recursion to write, right? It's, it's, it's like really pretty simple. Like you go to each item, you evaluate them one at a time, and for each item you pick like reject or accept, and then you pick the better of the two actions. Okay, so then what are like the base cases in this recursion? Well, we have to make sure that like, well, first of all, uh, it could be that this subtraction Carry is, is kind of invalid, right? Because it could be that we don't have enough capacity to take this item. Uh, so there's different ways you can handle that. You can like check it in the call site and exclude it from the max. But a trick I've you know, been showing you all a lot lately is 
you know, it's often much easier to kind of just allow this general case and then just say that if you ever have a case where you have less than zero capacity, just return like negative infinity for that or something. So in other words, like let's say let's say this drop this number is less than zero, right? Let's say this number is less than zero. Then if this call returns negative infinity, then this is also negative infinity, and then this will never be chosen in the max. Right? Like, th if this is negative infinity, then this term will always dominate. Like, that's why we set it to negative infinity. It's just kind of a trick for excluding it in the max. It makes the code much more convenient, right, when you code it, because otherwise, you'd have to do a check here. You'd have to say, you know, it's either max of this or just this if you don't have the capacity. You'd have to do, like, an if-else statement. And you can do that, but, uh, you know, it's a very common trick that's used to kind of, like, substitute in, like, plus minus infinity were appropriate. Uh, okay, so then uh, in that case, if, the, if this is the approach we want to take, then uh, we can uh, write, you know, our the, this is kind of the general case, and we can write our base cases basically as follows. So first of all, if uh, w is like less than zero, so if we have like nothing, if, if we are in an invalid state, then, then uh, the answer is negative infinity. And uh, finally, the other case is if we reach the end, right? If we reach the end, then what is the value of that actually? It should be zero, right? If you reach the end and you have nothing more to do, the maximum amount you can get from that point forward is zero. You have to be sure to check these in the right order because if you reach the end and you're in an invalid state, you still have to return negative infinity. Uh, that's kind of like a common mistake, you know, people check base cases in the wrong order. Uh, but, you know, like assuming it's kind of like, you know, this is a return or it's structured like an else if or whatever. Uh, if i equals equals, let's call it n, n is just the size of the array, then return zero. And then finally, otherwise, you know, use this formula. So, so these are essentially going to be like the base cases for this recursion. Okay, so uh, I think that this part so far is like relatively straightforward. Uh, you know, any, any questions on this? Yep? What would you think about taking the maximum of f of i plus 1 and w minus wi plus bi and then multiply that whole thing by the sign of W minus W I. So that if it's negative, you're multiplying by minus one, and then that would be the thing that is a, instead of having to check mm. if, that it's less than zero and then returning minus. Oh, like, like take this expression and then add an additional like time sign of W minus right. W I. Right. Um, well, I guess, like in this case, like yeah, in this case, there's like no negative value, no negative totals when they're valid. Uh, so I guess in this case, it's valid to do that because you will get a negative number in that case. Um, well, the one thing you got to be careful of is like the treatment of zero. You would have to make sure that if the, if this is zero, then this is still a valid. This is still valid to take if this is exactly zero. So you have to make sure you treat zero as if it's like a positive sign. Oh. Uh, but other than that, 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 that would be valid here because, you know, as long as you're scaling this whole thing by the sign of this, and you only, so, so you would get a negative number if and only if this is invalid, and then that would exclude this, and you would, you know, instead take that. I mean, I guess that works, but that just seems kind of like, it's, I, I guess it's like, a, because it's like a less standard trick, I think it would be like, you know, probably confusing if you were to put it into code. Like other people reading your code might be like, why are you doing this? Like, what is this? Uh, but whereas like the negative infinity substitution is like, I mean, it's also kind of a hack, but it's like a very like common standard hack. So people understand it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, whenever you do, you know, if you want to do it the non-hacky way, you should just like not even call this with negative arguments. But if you, you know, are going to do it the hacky way, then I uh, use like a standard hack, I guess, is the best advice I can give. Oh, okay, any other questions about this? Okay, uh, yeah, I think this is like relatively straightforward. One interesting, um, 
Well, okay, before we go into the interesting variation, let's uh, talk like what, the, what is like the time complexity of this? We can, we can see what the time complexity is for looking at, from look, just looking at this like general formula. Because the base cases are obviously evaluating in just like constant time. Uh, so what is like the time complexity of this? Like how do we, you know, everyone remember of, so, of course like how do we count time complexity of dynamic programming solutions, right? It's a number of distinct states multiplied by the time per state. Uh, so uh, what do we mean by distinct states? Like distinct sets of function arguments that this can be called with. Now, you know, remember in code this will probably look like, you know, in code there will of course be other arguments here. This function will look like i, w, the input array a, and the dynamic programming cache, and there'll be like some extra arguments here and here, but these arguments don't really count because they don't vary over the course of the recursion, or at least the, the input array doesn't vary over the course of the recursion, and the cache is just kind of a rider. It doesn't really like, it's not part of the problem, it's just, you know, you're passing it around so you can access it. Uh, but like the, the real recursion is essentially captured in this. Uh, so what is the time complexity? It's a number of states, right? Number of states multiplied by the time per state. So what is the time per state? How much time is consumed inside this function? Well, it's actually just order one, right? Because we don't count the time it actually takes to run this function. That's what it means to count only the time inside this function. We, uh, but the operations inside this function are just like initiating the function calls and doing an addition and doing the max. We don't count the time spent inside this call or inside this call. Uh, so this is completely order one, like every operation is order one, like all the adds and maxes. So this is order one, time per state. And how many different states are there? Like for how many different states should we count this order one? Well, uh, you know, so, so okay, so how high can this i go? It can go from like zero to n, right? So essentially n plus one, like order n. Uh, so there are order n times uh, and what's, how, how uh, high can this parameter go? Well, it starts at w, and it can go down to zero. Uh, and if it goes to a negative number, then it's immediately a base case. Uh, so the number of like non-base case scenarios is basically um, zero to w, right? So uh, order w. So you get this product, and this evaluates to order n w. Okay, so the running time of this is order n w, where w is like the total weight limit you have, and n is the number of elements. So if all the weights are small, this is looking pretty good. But if all, but if the weights can be like really large, this is potentially bad, right? So it kind of depends on the granularity of the weights. Like if the weights are like, okay, you only have a limit of 100 pounds and everything is just at the nearest pound, you just have like an item that weighs one, another item that weighs five, then this is like really efficient. But, uh, you know, how would you deal with decimals? Well, decimals would have to be like standardized to an integer in this case. So like, for example, if things can have up to four things after the decimal, then you would have to multiply everything through by 10,000 and uh, treat everything as integers that represent the number of like 10 thousandths of a pound you have. Uh, so essentially, like, the weight can get really large in that case. Right? If, if the weights have a lot of granularity, if the weights can be like things from like one to a million, then this number can get very large and this algorithm will be kind of slow. And, you know, if we draw out the kind of like, if we understand like what the recursion tree of this is, we can see kind of like what it is and why there are overlapping subproblems and why dynamic programming works here. Uh, so think of it this way, like initially we start at like some index zero and w, right? And then we make like some choice here. Under some set of choices, we will take some index one and we will have like some weight minus weight zero. And in another case, we will advance to the next index at the same weight, right? And then here we will again make some choices. Like there will be some choice like this. There will be some choice where it's like two weight minus weight one or whatever. Uh, there will be some choice where it's like two weight minus weight zero, and there will be some choice where it's like two weight minus weight zero minus weight one, if that makes sense. Like, like this is the path where you took both of the first items. Here you took the first one but didn't take the second one. Here you didn't take the first one but you took the second one, and here you took neither. 
So you kind of, and, and you know, this kind of keeps expanding. So now, if you did naive recursion, you know, like this would expand by a factor of two, you know, every step of the way. And this would like definitely be like an exponential time backtracking algorithm. But uh, uh, with dynamic programming, what will happen? So basically, we are kind of deduplicating these cases based on this value. That's what's happening with, in, in the case of dynamic programming. Uh, like maybe all four of these cases will be different. It's hard to say when the cases will merge. But what we know is that we know that like, we know if there's not too many different possible total weights you can have, at some point these will merge, right? Because this is kind of expanding exponentially. There's one situation here, there's two here, four, eight, sixteen, and so on, at each level, right? But if there's only like a thousand possible weights, then pretty soon there will be some duplication. Like maybe if weight zero and weight one were equal, then maybe these cases are already the same, right? Maybe these are already the same in this case. And we're reusing this case then, if weight zero and weight one were equal. If not, then, you know, then these are distinct. But at some point down the line, as we expand this further, some of these like subtracted out sums will be equal. And then we'll get some deduplication of the cases. So this differs a little bit in, uh, from other dynamic programming problems we've seen, where it was like really, really easy to find, you know, where the, where the duplicated case is. And here it's a little bit harder, it's a little bit unpredictable, it depends on the data. But the point is, it'll definitely happen somewhere if you only have like a very limited range of Ws, then, and, and you have like a fair amount of indices, then it'll have to happen because you can see that, you know, this doubles at every stage. So somewhere along the line, there's going to be a duplication pretty fast. Uh, you know, because if there's only W different weights, then, you know, at most log two W levels down in the tree, you will get some duplication. Okay, so this is, um, uh, you know, the time complexity of the problem. Um, now, you can see that if the weight is really large, you can run into a situation where the, you know, the time complexity will be really bad, right? Like, let's say, let's say all the weights can span from one to a million. Then the running time is like a million n. Okay. But one, once in an interview, I ran into like the following question, and this is like not like hard to answer. You just have to be like not so like tethered to this particular implementation, and you can see the solution. So the question was like this: like I was told that like the weights to this could be really large. It was basically like a knapsack problem. Uh, it might not have been like presented as such, but effectively, when you like distilled the problem, it was a knapsack problem. But every item gives you a value of one or two. So there's not like, there's not like a lot of different values. Like every item has value one or it has value two. Um, and the weights can be quite large, however. And your weight budget can be quite large. So given that, is this still the best algorithm to solve it with? Now, in the case of just one and two, you might actually even be able to work out some like greedy algorithm where you figure out exactly how many twos you can take and how many ones and you might even be able to come up with like some simpler approach. Uh, but kind of this is worth thinking about a little more generally, which is uh, what if your weights can be large but the values are small? So good news is we can just kind of very like easily flip this algorithm on its head to get a solution whose running time will be order n times v, where v is like the maximum value you can get. So uh, how can we do that? Well, we just kind of have to frame the problem differently. Like what we can think about is we can think about it like this. We can think about it, um, let f of i comma v be the minimum. Like, like here, okay, here we use the weight, right? And we said, this is the maximum value you can get if you're at this position and you have this much capacity left. Now we can say, uh, like if we want to flip it on its head, we can say, we're kind of inverting the problem here. We're saying, uh, what, is the, what is the minimum amount of weight with which we can capture V worth of value? 
if we are currently at position i in the sequence. So we're still doing the approach of like every, we, for every item we decide take or not take. And so our state now is like we want to capture a certain amount of value v, and we have an index i, and this is like a gold value. This is how much value we want to capture. And what the answer to this function is basically the minimum weight with which we can do it. And you see what the point of this is. Uh, after, you know, you, after you do this, you will be able to basically say for each value is the minimum weight you need to capture that value. Is that something you have or not? Right? Like if you can say that, uh, oh, that, that okay, uh, well, eventually we will want to evaluate f of zero, and then uh, like we, we, we will basically want to know what this value is for like every possible value. And for each one, we will get some output. We will get like some minimum weight. Like we will ask, okay, how about zero, I don't know, zero, 100. Can we get 100 units of value? And this function will give us something like, I don't know, it'll say, okay, to get 100 units of value, you need 30 weight. And then we will say, okay, we have 30 weight. How about, you know, can we get 200 units? You can even do like a binary search on it or whatever, but that usually isn't necessary. Usually you can just kind of check the values one by one. So to write this function, I mean, it's, it's just going to be like a simple inversion, uh, simple kind of uh, formula like this. Uh, but, but again, you know, if I'm, you know, at some position in the list, uh, you know, I determine whether to take or not take this item i. Uh, okay, so, First choice is I take the item. Uh, so, so, so this is like, what is the minimum weight I need to get a value of at least v? Uh, so if I, if I take the item, I get f of i plus 1. I advance to the next index. And my, the, the target value I need to accomplish becomes v minus vi. This is like the remaining target value I need to accomplish. Um, and then I have to take the penalty for the item. I have to, you know, I have to burden myself with its weight, right? And then uh, if you don't take the item, then you just advance to the next spot with no additional weight, but also no reduction in your goal value. And here we want the minimum of these two things, right? Not the maximum. Because we want to do the better of these two things. We want to do the thing that gives us a lower weight. So this is just kind of a good illustration of how like some optimization problems can be inverted like this. Uh, so here we've inverted the problem, and now the good news is that the parameter that is very large, which is the weight in this hypothetical, the parameter that is very large is actually appearing as the output of the function. This is very nice because the output of the function, the size of the values that can appear uh, you know, as results of the function, that doesn't enter into the time complexity calculation, right? I mean, I guess it could if it were like, you know, giant like big integers and you had to take into account like, you know, the size of just manipulating the value through arithmetic expression. You had to like take that as like a non-constant cost and maybe sure, somehow it could. But assuming like, you know, the things we normally assume when we analyze these sorts of algorithms, uh, you know, the, the, like how big these output values are, like this minimum could be, the answer to this minimum could be like one trillion. And it doesn't enter into our time complexity. What enters into our, into our time complexity now are i and v. So in the version of the problem where I have, where each value can be 1 or 2, the maximum v right, is 2n. And the maximum i is n. And so, I saw, and so this problem is now solved in n squared time. Now, this may not even be the best complexity for the particular version where you have 1 and 2. You might be able to come up with some like tricky solution. But like in a more general case, it's going to be very hard. Like if I tell you all the values are between 1 and 10, uh, yeah, I mean, this is probably going to be like the most straightforward solution. You, you know, you, you just set it up like this, and then, you know, if every value is between, if every item's value is between 0 and 10, then the maximum value you could ever hope to get is 10n, and so this parameter is bounded by 10n, and this parameter is bounded by n, and you get like 10n squared as the running time, regardless of how big the weights are, because the weights are not appearing in this expression. So this is like a very good trick to know and see, uh, because you know sometimes you can use that. And actually, this will come up again in just a short while, 
the, there will be a problem where we will see that like we can't really do what we want with the weights, so we have to kind of solve the problem based on based on value. Uh, okay, uh, any uh, questions about this before I go on? So what do you return in the end? Oh, in the end? Uh, you mean like what is the like the global overall solution to the problem? Oh, uh, here it's just going to be like, um, well, oh, okay, so obviously we want the index f to be, like we want the index i to be zero, right? Um, and then, oh, okay, so our goal is actually to maximize the value, right? So how do we know that we've maximized the value? Well, uh, we, okay, so we don't actually know what v we want, right? But what we want is we want the maximum v that is lower than our w of budget. Now, let's say we know that v ranges between 0 and 10n. So here's what we can do. We can just iterate. We can try f of 0, 0, f of 0, 1, f of 0, 2, etc. right? So like, we will write this equation, and then we will kind of like try all of these, uh, all the way up to f of 0, 10n, or whatever. And each one of these gives us a weight. Each one of us gives us the minimum weight at which this particular value can be accomplished. Right? And then what we have to do is we have to say, OK, uh, if I want a value of 0, well, of course, this can be accomplished with just 0 weight. Uh, this is like some value. This is some value, some value. And I just go up to the point where this is not exceeding my budget. Like, I have a budget, right? I have a limit w. And as I try to get higher and higher values, like, this is actually in ascending order. This is going to be in ascending order. As I try to get higher and higher values, the, the amount of weight here is going to increase. This is going to be in ascending order, these weights. So I could even binary search for the optimal weight here. I, I mean, I could uh, you know, binary search on this value here to find like, the optimal weight. But, uh, but I could also uh, you know, just scan through them linearly too, and that would be kind of OK here, because the time consumed by that would be small as compared to the time spent in the dynamic programming. I think yeah, you'll have to uh, linearly scan through because you may get a higher value with lower weight. Uh, the way I've set this up, uh, it won't actually happen, but that's probably because just like there's like a distinction that I'm making here that uh, you know maybe I didn't make like altogether clear. Uh, so so, for, so so I defined my function as not being exact. I basically said in my function that um, that like f of i and b is going to be the it, it's it's going to be the minimum weight you need to achieve a value of at least b. There is not a constraint saying that this is the minimum weight you need to achieve exactly b. It's like it's like you need this much to achieve at least b. And so because of that, like this is actually guaranteed non-decreasing. Uh, it's, be, it's because, you know, anything that you can, you, like if, if it costs you, like, like say if it costs you 10 <coughs> to achieve a value of at least 2, then, you know, certainly you can achieve a value of at least 1 with 10 as well. I mean, maybe you can achieve it with even less. Um, and the, like, the, the only difference it actually makes in the formula, like whether you formulate it to be like, like th does this mean the value you need to get, the minimum value you need to get exactly b, or the minimum value you need to get at least b? It'll actually be all in the base cases. It just, like, the question is like, when this goes negative, what do you do? Do you return like an, in, in, an invalid value? Or do you say going, going negative is actually valid and just has weight zero? Like here, in this case, the base case will be that if I see a function call where the, where the target value is negative, I will say you accomplished your goal already, return zero. You need no more weight. And I will do that even if the goal value is negative. That means that something previously kind of went over the target value. But I'll say I'm, I'm okay with going over the target value. Because this is not a weight, this is not the constraint, this is the value. I exceeded my target value, sure, but okay, just now report weight zero. Um, so, you know, this will be like some like non-decreasing sequence, like so. 
Uh, it wouldn't have mattered much if I did do it that way and this was like exactly value v. It wouldn't have been like really a problem. Then you would just have to scan through it linearly. But either way, like you, you, you probably should just simplify your code. It, like if you do code this, you probably shouldn't like bind research this. I mean, you can, but you, you really don't need to. Uh, one really important kind of implementation note, um, in case this wasn't like entirely understood, is like we have to make sure that each of these function calls is like still reusing the same cache, right? Because if you scan through this linearly and you reset the cache, like the dynamic programming cache that's being passed around to the function, if you actually reset this uh, internally, like every time you do one of these calls, then that's, you know, that's bad. That will, uh, you know, make each of these kind of evaluate, you will no longer have the guarantee that each state is evaluated only once. Each state will be evaluated once per top level call. Uh, but if you share the same cache between all of these top-level calls, uh, you know, init, init the cache once and then do the loop where you loop through all these values, uh, then it's fine. Then you still have to guarantee that you will, you will uh, evaluate each state only once and you will get the guaranteed time complexity of, of what is it, n times the maximum value of v. Okay, uh, any more questions on this formulation? Yep. So if you didn't cache it, it would be like n cubed Well, it depends what you mean by like didn't cache. Uh, well, okay, so before we talk about specific complexities, let's define like the exact parameters of the problem. Okay, so let's say each, like, you know, each array, array of i is from like 1 to 10, right? So let's say we're doing the 1 to 10 version of this problem. Uh, and let's say furthermore that the weights can be quite large, and, and so we're using this version. And yeah, so in this case, uh, you know, the maximum value can reach 10n, and this can reach n, so the time complexity is order, order n squared here. Order n squared, if you can guarantee that every state is evaluated at least once, which means that all of these top level function calls have to use the same cache. So what would the time complexity be if you do not guarantee that? Like each of these function calls are completely independent and run this order n squared algorithm independently? Yes, in that case it is n cubed, if, that's, if that was your question, yep. Uh, it is n cubed because you know for, you may 10 n times do this n squared algorithm, then yeah, you will inflate that to n cubed. Uh, technically, like if you're seeing this, um, one way to think about it is like let's assign some value to this parameter. Let's call this like I don't know d. Uh, d is like this maximum entry in each individual array. Then this algorithm is actually order d n squared because d n is the limit on this, and this is just always n. So this is d n squared. But if you did this, you would introduce another d n so that it would actually become like d squared n cubed. So it's it's kind of even worse. Like we were just hiding the d behind a constant. But if the d is not a constant, then it's like d squared n cubed. But yeah, it's still like polynomial time and all that. If you do this without any kind of caching anywhere, this will be probably exponential. Because we already saw that the tree expands by a factor of two in every stage. Yep. So if you're going to do bottoms up, um, yep. you begin with uh, i to the n, correct? But then your v loop from one to one. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, so it, it's good to discuss, you know, how to do this uh, bottom up. Uh, let's, let, let's try it. Uh, so, so, so bottom up, we just have to find an evaluation order. So clearly, we want to evaluate i in reverse order, right? Like, we want to evaluate higher i's before lower i's, because we see that a lower i will only depend on the next value of i. So effectively, that means that uh, we like our top level loop, you know, I'm, I'm not going to write like the full code right now. We can follow up, you know, after the session with like the code samples. It's much more efficient that way. Uh, that's how we always do it for people who are new. Uh, but, you know, at the, like this suggests that like the top level loop should be on i probably. Like top level, we will probably iterate, you know, for i from, you know, like the first case, like n or whatever or n minus one to zero. Like the top level loop should be something like that. We will evaluate higher values of i first, so that when we get to a lower value of i, we already have these in the cache, and then there's no need to do the recursion. We have these in the cache. That's how bottom up works, right? 
Um, now, what about what about this? Well, actually, like the bees, the bees can be done in any order, right? Because because a higher like a particular value of i is not dependent on other cases that are are at the same i. So, in other words, if you kind of draw the grid, you can conceptualize this as a grid. You can see this dimension as i, and you can see this dimension as as like v. If you are currently at this set, or this is like f of i v, your evaluation is dependent on some like two cells over in the next column. Like maybe you're dependent on this one, and well, it's a bad illustration, but like you may be okay. You, you'd be dependent on this one. Uh, this is like i plus one v. I plus one, this would be like this case, I plus one with the same B, and it would be dependent on some other cell over here that is like, you know, this value. V minus V I, I plus one. But the point is, is that like this particular cell right here, it only like depends on things over the next column, so you don't have to worry about which order you scan this column in. Um, so it basically means like your next loop, you just give it like the simplest possible shape. We will just do it like for the, from, I don't know, 0 to n minus 1 or whatever you want to do. But any order is fine. Uh, now, I, I do want to mention one kind of... Why n minus 1? Sorry, not n minus 1. Uh, sorry, 0 to, like, v max. The sum of the v's. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 0 to, like, v max, where v max is, like, the maximum possible value you could get. Yeah. Ah, uh, like uh, so in places I've used like v and like you know when I've written v at the top level I mean this like v max and when I write v inside a function I mean like this v. Uh, I I I, th I think that was like pretty understood, but here we have to make the distinction. Yeah, so like this goes from like i from n minus one to zero, and this goes from like zero to v max or whatever. Ah, uh, yep. Sorry, so just make sure I understand the dependency graph that you made there. Yeah. So it doesn't necessarily take from a smaller v, that's what you're trying to present. It could take anywhere from the problem of v. Well, it does actually necessarily take from a smaller v. It does. I'm just saying that this fact is actually not really important for us because if we've already agreed that the evaluation order is going to evaluate higher i's first, then basically the current column of i's depends only on the next column of i's, which has already been evaluated, if we're doing higher i's first. So when we are on the current column of i's, there is like no more dependency. And then for Vmax, does that mean that we have to have an outer loop, which if we do a binary search, that do binary search on the Vmax on the outer core? Because we were choosing between 0 to 10n, right, initially. But that was from the... Um, You're talking about in like the top level. <coughs> Yeah, so, so this is not like part of this algorithm. This is like first first here we just evaluate like every cell in this grid essentially. Uh, you're talking about like now we return to the top level. Well, you can see the top level is basically being like this is index zero, right? So essentially we just want like the you know the uh, well the, we want like we want the maximum v in this in this column that it, the, whose weight is still below our target weight. So think of it like in the bottom up solution, we would just populate this whole matrix, we would populate this whole grid, and then we would just check the last, after we're done, we would just check this last row, and we would you know, stop at whichever cell you know, has the maximum V while not going over a weight limit. So think of it as like for every I in V, we've determined what is the minimum weight required to pull off that I in V. Uh, but if, you know, and then in the end, I'm interested in is like, okay, I'm starting at index zero, but I, you know, I'm flexible as to my target value, right? I mean, I want to make it as large as possible, but I don't know ahead of time what it's going to be. So I just look at every target value and I say, okay, can I get this value with the weight I have? Can I get this value? Can I get this value? And then whichever one is the best one that I can actually get with, because for each one, I know what is the minimum necessary weight. And I can say, is that over my budget or no? And so then I would just take the best one that I can take out of these. So, sorry, so what is Vmax really then? Uh, Vmax is like the maximum possible value. So like it, it's the maximum possible value of any solution. So like take, uh, for example, take all of the values in the original input and add them all up. 
you know that the optimal solution cannot have larger values. <coughs> that is Vmax. So for example, if all the values are between 1 and 10, you know that Vmax is like 10n, because you know that no matter what solution it is, it like could not possibly be larger than uh, 10n, because that is just the value of like if you take everything. So does, does that mean that we're actually doing more computation compared with the minimization uh, solution? It, uh, yes, it could mean it. You, you could maybe fix that uh, by just, you know, you could refuse to evaluate cells that already have gone over your budget. Like, you, you could say, like, okay, if uh, I, like, if to get a value of 200, uh, I am already over budget, um, then, you know, I won't even try to get 201 onwards. Yeah. There could be a little more computation, yeah, for that reason. I, I do, I do want to show like one trick here that people do. Um, yeah, I do want to show one trick because uh, this is like pretty common. Like probably if you look at an implementation of this, you will like see this done because this is like pretty standard. Uh, and this is sometimes called space compression. So the idea is like the way we've like laid it out. It kind of sounds like the top down or the bottom up solution is going to have time complexity, you know, order and W or NV, whichever what, whichever of these two versions you do. Th like this is the weight version, right? This was the weight version of the formula, and this was the uh, value version of the formula. You you do which, whichever one is best for you. Like if your weights are small, then you want this one. If your if your you know like th this one is good if the weights are small, right? Uh, this one is good for small weight, and this one is good for a small value. Because in this one, the value appears in the time complexity, and in this one, the weight appears in the time complexity. So you can do whichever one of those is better for you. And so like this is like nw, and this one is like nv max, right? n times v max, time complexity. Uh, so right now, like yes, the time complexity is n times v max, but what is the space complexity? I'll just write this in more human language time. Uh, what is the space complexity? Well, if you do it in that like matrix bottom-up style I showed, or you do it like top-down, uh, it's going to be again n times v max, right? Because you know how do we determine the space taken by a dynamic programming solution? It is number of uh, the amount of space per state, which is almost always order one, right? Unless you're caching like arrays or something, which is usually kind of a bad idea anyway. Uh, so space per state is order one, and multiplied by number of states. Uh, so you know, which is n times v max. So okay, so time and space are both this. But oftentimes you'll see an implementation, uh, and this is like very like common trick for bottom up solutions. Uh, that you know the space, the time will remain the same, but we will reduce the space to just order uh, v max. We will like eliminate this n. Um, and the way it works is basically you see that, look, look at this i. So if i depended on every future value of i, then this would, might not be possible. But i only depends on i plus 1, which means that if, if you are doing this bottom up and you're going from highest i to lowest i, right? So, you know, essentially, essentially here are your i's, like this is your current i and this is i plus 1, your, the current i that you're evaluating depends on i plus 1. But it doesn't depend on any of these larger i's. So that means that at this point, at the point where we've advanced this far in the computation, we can actually like forget all of these. So the common trick will be you just keep like two arrays. You keep, you keep, your, you, you keep the array of the current i, so this is like, you know, all the Vmax values, like we still have this other dimension of the grid, right? So uh, basically it means that for the current i, um, we, we, we keep this row for the current i, we keep all the different v's, you know, for the current i, and we keep all the different v's for the, cur for the current i plus one. But we can discard like all of these, and these we have not evaluated. So we will only need like these two like arrays of size v max. We keep, you know, we, we, we keep an array that ha for the current i has the value for every v, 
And for the current i plus 1 has the value for every b. We use the i plus 1 array to read the values like we needed we need for these reads. Uh, and we write the values to this one. And then when we're done filling it up, as long as it's not like the last one that we had to do, the zero, right, then we will swap them. Like this i will become the i plus 1, right? Like we will, we, we will make this one the i plus 1. And this will be the new i. And then we will forget this one. Or rather, we will probably just reuse its space. We'll probably just be you know, clearing this one out and reusing its space here. And so basically, at any given time, we will just kind of maintain two arrays and we'll kind of swap them. At one point, i becomes the next i plus 1, and so on. And we just kind of iterate forward, and then eventually we get to 0. And in fact, based on the fact that these access only lower values of v, and that this is where you can bring that in. In fact, it's possible to only do this with one array. We're just getting into like clever trickery now. There's no like deep conceptual meaning here. Uh, but you know, if you want to do it with only one array, you can. Because what you can do is, let's say you just keep an array of all the v's. So this is, this is v now. Let's say you just keep an array of all the v's. And let's say that somehow you manage to populate this array for i plus 1, right? Like, let's say this is i plus 1, and you've populated this array. Now, when I go to populate i, if I populate it from the back, things will work out. Because let's say, let's say um, I evaluate this value first. This value will depend on the value that was here before, which I can read before I destroy it. Uh, and some lower value of b, which hasn't been destroyed yet. So I will kind of like populate this value with a new value. And then, uh, like, let's say I'm on this cell. This cell only depends, uh, like if I want to fill this cell with i, with the correct value not for i plus 1, but for i, I can first read the value for i plus 1 b out of here. And then I can, you know, read some smaller value of b that still has the i plus 1 elements, and then I can override this cell. So essentially, as I'm going through this, what will happen is there will be like some subset that has already been filled in with the values for i plus 1, some subset of these that I've already updated for i plus 1, and some subset that I have not updated. Uh, or sorry, some subset that I've already updated for i, and some subset that I have not updated, and st these still have the i plus 1 values for that b. But then, like, when I, when I try to, you know, take this cell, and I try to update this v for i, kind of extending this boundary, I will be able to do that because this cell only depends, this cell depends on i plus 1 values, specifically this one, which I haven't destroyed yet, and some earlier value. So then in this case, like, we can actually find a way to do this with just one array, just make an array of size max b, and then on every i, update it from the back. You can't update it from the front, right? Then it has to be from the back, because you must preserve this, like, low value at a lower b, because you might need it. Like, this, uh, the computation of this cell might refer to this value, but it's not possible that it might refer to this value. So these are safe to destroy. Okay, uh, so you know, this is a good trick to see, and this is like really common too, like it's com pretty common to see this in actual implementations if you look, so. But, it, but it, remember, it is all like just kind of tricks, right? Uh, like the really important thing to focus on is like the concept. So the concepts that are important here is, well, of course, first just understanding how to set up recursion, but you probably already, you know, knew that from the previous classes. But, you know, this is a cool concept. Like, you know, think of, like, inverting the function maybe to, you know, put a better parameter into this position. Like, you know, some problems you have the opportunity to do that. Like, maybe if you do it as per the standard version, the complexity will be very high because maybe the weights can be very large. But if the values can be small, you can kind of turn the problem around. And instead of making it about you know, for the given weight, how do I maximize the value? You can instead ask, for the given value, how do I minimize the weight? And then the fact that you're minimizing the weight means that the weight is not part of the function signature, which means that it's been eliminated from the time complexity. So this is a very, like, nice, you know, trick to know. Okay. So, uh, this is kind of like the classic treatment of, you know, the knapsack problem. Um, 
probably most treatments of it don't even mention this kind of like value inversion. But uh, I want to go a little beyond. I want to uh, kind of show you, uh, well, so, so here's the thing. We now know that we can solve the knapsack problem efficiently if all the weights are small. The time complexity will be order nw, and we will use the weight version. We now know we can also solve it efficiently if the values are small, too. But what if the values and the weights are large? Well, then in that case, we don't have like an efficient version available to us to solve this problem exactly. And I won't really cover like specifically the details of what this means right now, but generally it is actually like known by like, you know, computer scientists and what's called like computational complexity theory that uh, we, we, we know that like essentially uh, the knapsack problem is what's called NP-complete, which means that it's unlikely that an exact algorithm uh, for it exists. That is uh, polynomial time. It's probable that the best algorithm for it is going to be something like exponential time for the most general version of the problem where both the weights and the values can be very large. And exponential time here is interpreted uh, based on like the length of the input. So you might say, well, well, no, it's, it's not exponential in any case, right? It's either NW, which seems like some kind of polynomial, or it's NV, which is some kind of polynomial. But the thing is, like, neither of these things are actually considered polynomial because uh, the weight is actually, like, it's, it's not, it, it's not, the, the maximum size of the weight is not proportional to, like, the number of elements in an array or something like that. It's actually proportional to just like the pure numeric value of the thing, which in terms of how large it is, like, you know, you can assign a weight of like this to something, right, with only a fairly minimum amount of space. Uh, like, essentially, the input could be quite small and the weight could be enormous. Like, the, the maximum weight that something can be is basically exponential in the size of the input string. Which is why uh, this, like, W and this V, like, these are not, like, if this was, like, the number of elements in an array, yes, this would be polynomial. But this is, like, just a numeric value. So it is not considered polynomial by that standard. Um, I mean, if that confuses you, don't worry too much about it. That's not the main point of today. Uh, I, you know, I'm not discussing, like, this whole theory of NP completeness now. It's quite uh, complicated to understand. That would require its, like, own session at a minimum. Uh, but, uh, you know, the idea is like, okay, we think that probably, like, there's not going to be, like, an exact algorithm that in the most kind of general case where the values and the weights are very large, you know, very granular, we don't think there's going to be, like, an exact algorithm that solves it exactly that is also, like, very efficient and runs in, like, substantially less than exponential time. Uh, but what, we, what uh, a really cool idea is, and it's based on like a really simple concept, but it's kind of like really interesting how it's developed, is we can actually use dynamic programming to develop an approximation algorithm for this problem. Uh, now, what does it mean to approximate uh, this problem? Well, it means something like this. I will like set a threshold. So I will say, for example, 99.9%. .9%. And I will guarantee to you that my algorithm returns a solution that is at least 99.9% .9 of the value of the optimal solution. I, like, I may not be able to find the optimal solution, I may not know what it is, but I will be able to guarantee that whatever that solution is, I either found it or I found another very similar solution that I can't quite distinguish from the optimal solution because it's so close. So I will guarantee that, you know, I won't just return like a, I, I won't guarantee that I return the optimal solution, but I guarantee that the solution I return will be like in some sense very, very close to the optimal. So let me just do a time check. Okay, it might be time for a break before I go into this, but before we do that, let me just kind of, you know, before the break to show you this. Um, so first, I just want to show you kind of how something like an approximation algorithm can work by showing you like something that doesn't use dynamic programming, just a very, very simple uh, approximation algorithm for the knapsack problem. 
Uh, and so this is kind of like the heuristic we did before. Remember, the, remember before we mentioned that if you just have a list of items, maybe like a really sensible way to do it is to compute these like ratios, right? Compute these uh, ratios, uh, value one to weight one, value two to weight two, value three to weight three, right? Compute these ratios and take items in order of that ratio. And then we saw how actually there's some edge cases where this re leads to like a really bad behavior. But maybe we can remedy that to give an algorithm that, ha so that has some kind of guaranteed performance. So earlier we called this algorithm a heuristic. Heuristic just means kind of like, it's like rule of thumb. It doesn't really have like a performance guarantee. It's just something that like kind of maybe works well in practice for a lot of cases. But maybe it has some like really like catastrophic failures. Uh, like the like edge cases I showed you. But on a lot of inputs, that algorithm would actually produce pretty good results. Um, because it's, pretty, it's based on a pretty reasonable principle. Well, what we can do is we can actually convert our heuristic into uh, an approximation algorithm. Now, an approximation algorithm is basically just a heuristic with a performance guarantee. So we will basically say, uh, I guarantee to you that my heuristic approximates the correct answer to like, within like some bound of the value. So in this case, uh, for this very simple algorithm, and we'll be able to do much better when we look at the dynamic programming version. But at first, I'm just gonna approximate it within a factor of two. So this is what it means. I guarantee that the solution I return is at least half as good as the optimal solution. It's within 50%. I will always return a valid solution that I guarantee. And I also guarantee that the solution I return is no worse than 50% of the optimal solution. And we saw that previously, like the heuristic did not achieve that. So all we need is one like trivial modification to the heuristic, okay? So instead of like, so, so the heuristic was, Take, uh, like, take the items, sort them by this ratio, and then take them one at a time until you can't take them anymore, right? To, uh, you know, just, just uh, take the items in order of their ratio, and then if you're out of capacity for the next item, just stop. And we saw that that doesn't have any kind of ratio that it guarantees you. Here's kind of a modified version of this algorithm. Do the same thing, take the items one at a time, but keep going until you pass the capacity. So don't stop when you, or, or like before we were basically saying, okay, add items to your knapsack, but, but as soon as you have one that you cannot add, don't add it, and then just stop. Now we're saying add items to your knapsack, and the first one that kind of violates that constraint, like let's say this one violates that constraint. So we add this one to the knapsack, we add this one to the knapsack, and let's say this one, violates the constraint. Uh, we, we have too much weight now. Set this item aside. Now compare the solution we got before, which is this one. Uh, compare the solution given here with the value of this one lone item and take the better of the two. And that will actually guarantee that you get within 50% of the optimal solution. Uh, why is that? Well, remember like the catastrophic, like here's the intuition behind it. The catastrophic case we saw before was this. You take, like let this be your knapsack. Like this is like, uh, uh, like, like, you know, here, here's your like knapsack. Uh, here's the space that it has. The catastrophic case we saw before is you take a really valuable item that only uses a tiny portion of the knapsack, right? And then there's some really massive item that needs even more space than this, and now it can't fit, right? So this it, kind of remedy to it is what it's, it's saying is, yes, you will take this item and you will place it like this, but when that really massive item that couldn't fit before comes along, you will set it aside, and in the end you will decide, do you want that item or do you want this? Now, it may be still unclear like why exactly this is generating a solution that's within a factor of two of the optimal solution, but I will explain that. But you know, do you understand kind of like the intuition, hopefully, like behind this algorithm? This is just kind of kind of like very naively avoiding this like catastrophic case where like you, you said, you know, you have a ton of empty space and the next item would be like super good for you, but you can't take it. So okay, so here's what we'll do. We'll just we'll just put in items until we run out of space. 
But when the next item comes along, we won't just decide not to take it. We'll set it aside, and then we'll just compare which solution is better, the one we would have gotten before, or just this one item that we missed all by itself. Uh, it might not be clear to you yet why that's expected to work. But it's kind of just like a very naive remediation of the previous problem, where you had like a massive item come along here, and then you weren't able to take it. So we'll just set it aside. Uh, oh, and before we start this algorithm, it's important to say we also eliminate from the input any item that individually is too big to take. So like if there is an item that even by itself could never be taken, we drop it from the algorithm. Because we can never take it in any context, right? I mean, unless there's like items of negative weight, but here we're kind, of, we're kind of assuming all the items have like positive value and positive weight here, or at least like, or at least like positive weight and uh, yeah, at least positive weight. Okay. So um, now let me kind of demonstrate actually though why this approximates the optimal answer within a factor of two. Because imagine like you can kind of temporarily cheat in the knapsack problem. So essentially, you can temporarily exceed your maximum capacity. So you fit items into your knapsack, and you know here's your knapsack. Here comes item one. It occupies this space. And for this much space, because this was the most value-dense item, because you're still, you're still thinking them in order of that ratio, this was the most, this is item one, and it's the most value-dense item. So for this much space, you are getting the best possible value. Uh, then you get some other item two. And again, for this much space, this is absolutely the best possible uh, uh, the use of that space. And then let's say item three comes along, and item three is too big. Item three requires you to kind of like cheat and requires like all of this space. Uh, and this is the first item that violates the constraint. So now what we do is we never look at the other items past this. We set this item aside and we say, do we prefer this solution? Or do we prefer this solution? Now, whichever one we pick, at the very least, we can say we have a valid solution, right? Why is that? Because kind of by definition, th these two items did not by themselves violate the weight constraint, right? That's how we define that these are like in, in this solution as opposed to being in this solution. Like we said, these are, like, these are the items that you can take before you violate the constraint, and this is the first item violating the constraint. So this is a valid solution, clearly, because it didn't violate the constraint. Uh, this solution is valid, too, because it's a single item. And we already eliminated all items that could not be taken by themselves from the input. Uh, so both of these solutions are valid. Now, here's the thing. Together, when you look at this solution together, right? If you look at what's happening in this space. So like, let S1 be the value of this solution. Like, this solution is S1. And this solution is S2. Together, S1 plus S2 are better than the optimal solution. Why is that? It's because this space, which is the, the only space the valid solution can exist in, is used optimally, right? It takes the highest ratios and it uses all of the space. So this space it, uh, that any the optimal solution must live in is used completely optimally because each part takes, has taken the highest ratios possible in that space. Plus, this S1 plus S2 has some additional value that cannot be captured by an optimal solution. So at the very least, S1 plus S2 equals the optimal solution, uh, it, it, and it is you know, probably higher than the, any optimal solution. But, but now, you, you, see, you see why this must approximate the answer within a factor of two. It's because the sum of these two individual solutions are better than the optimal value, which means that in the very worst case, the better of these two is at least half. But if, if S1 plus S2 was equal to the optimal, then wouldn't you just take I3 and include it? Um, well, it depends what assumptions you make. Like, may, like maybe, maybe this can have like value zero or something. Uh, yeah, like, like if this one has like value zero or something. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so yeah, you know, 
Um, okay, so you have like S1 plus S2 is greater than the optimal solution. So it can't be that both of these are worse than half of the solution. Like if this one is less than half the optimal and this one is less than half the optimal, then this is not true. So one of these two parts is better. And you can easily find out which one. You know, just check the total value you added up here, check the value of this new item, and take one or the other. And of course, you know, you could modify the heuristic further to just kind of make it better in practice. Like it could be that if you decided to take I3, then you will also take some additional I, I4, I5, I6 until you run out of space again or something. Or, you know, you could develop an algorithm where if you do, do decide to take I1 and I2, then you skip I3 and you still try to take I4. Because why not, right? You can, you can try. Uh, but basically this simple scheme of going until you exceed the limit, setting the item that broke the limit aside, and, and comparing that to the solution like before you broke the limit and just taking the better of the two, this simple scheme guarantees a performance that is at least half of the optimal value. Okay, uh, any questions on this? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not like, like maybe like an easy argument to find, but I don't think it's like that hard to understand, right? Uh, so this is like, you know, constructing like a solution that is within a factor of two the optimal solution. But what is the running time of this, I guess, is like a good question to ask. What is the running time? Uh, well, all it really requires is it requires sort, right? Like there's no like dynamic programming here, there's no like states. Just, you know, for each value do a division, right? For each item do a division, calculate the ratio. That's linear time. Then sort by the ratio, okay, n log n. And then, uh, and so this is like all like n log n. Uh, yeah, and then you do like a linear pass to determine what the solution will be. So n log n, uh, it actually turns out you can even solve this problem in just purely linear time. Like you can do this approximation algorithm in purely linear time. To know how to do this, you have to know how to find the median of a collection in linear time. Why is this relevant? Uh, why, why does this have anything to do with the median? Um, well, because like what you're essentially asking is you're, you're kind of saying I have an ordered list of items. Uh, and, and basically, like, what you really need is you, like, like you just need to kind of find, uh, or, or, no, for, if you don't sort, if you avoid the sort, then you have an unordered list of items. So you have, like, some ratio one, ratio two, ratio three, et cetera. And you basically, like, uh, need to find which of these ratios, uh, you, you kind of need to find, like, a middle value that all the ratios above this value are going to be included in your solution. And that is not that is not like very dissimilar for having to find like the median in an array, and the same algorithm can be adapted to it. Like basically, you need something like quick select. So you will just kind of pick like a random one of these ratios. You will pick this ratio as a pivot, like at random, for example, or through some other means, and uh, you will basically divide the ratios into ratios that are better than that arbitrary ratio and ratios that are worse than that arbitrary ratio. And then you will kind of say, okay, if I take everything that is better than the ratio I just established, do I still have free space left? If yes, take all of those and then recurse on the remaining half. Uh, if no, then discard all of the ones that were too low and then recurse on the remaining half. This is exactly the same algorithm as quick select, basically. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't want to like, spend time discussing the details of how to do that. It's kind of besides the point here. But I just do want to note that this can even be improved to order n essentially using the quick select algorithm. Okay, uh, so now let's take a little break, and when we come back, we're gonna see the dynamic programming approximation algorithm, which um, allows us to find the solution uh, basically to an arbitrary degree of approximation, we'll see. We'll be able to develop the algorithm that, for example, you can approximate the answer to 99.9% .9 rather than just 50%.